Welcome to AP Environmental Science. In this video, we are going to talk a little bit about the ins and outs of what goes into calculating the total fertility rate. Now, this is discussed in both module 22 and 31 in your textbook if you want to look there for some additional information and examples on this topic. Now, to begin with, we're going to define total fertility rate, and this is the average number of children that a woman would have assuming that they are the average woman and the birth rates stay consistent throughout their entire childbearing years. Now childbearing years is right around from about 16 years old all the way up to about 45 years old. So that's kind of our range that we're really looking at. And there are several factors that affect total fertility rate. These are things like how old a woman is when she has her first child and how much education she has and if there even are opportunities available to her. And does she have access to family planning so that way she can decide when she starts to have children. And then also what is the government acts and policies really in that location? Are they encouraging women to kind of go out on their own and have their own status and own self-worth? Or are the government acts and policies really kind of mandating that women are subservient or that they are entirely dependent upon the males in their life? So these are all factors that really go into how many children a woman is actually going to have throughout their life. Now I included a graph here and this is the total fertility rate in the United States. So this goes back to about 1911 and we can see that during the Great Depression, women were not having as many children. That is due to a lot of different factors that are going on here. So during the Great Depression, people didn't have as much money, they didn't have as much food, they were likely to be living with other relatives, so there wasn't a whole lot of baby making going on during the Great Depression. However, we were still above, on average, two children per woman. Then we got into World War II era and that time period right after World War II, so into the 1950s, we saw this huge baby boom. And you've probably heard of the baby boomer generation. That's because that total fertility rate in the United States spiked up above three and a half children per woman. Then in the late 1960s, we see this sudden drop in total fertility rate. And that primarily has to do with access to the pill or birth control pills. That helped women to plan out when they were going to have their children and people started to delay their pregnancies. But then in the 1970s, there was that energy crisis. People thought the world was starting to become very unstable. So people started to delay having children. And shortly after that, things bounced back up and we were hovering right around two births per woman. And that's pretty close to where we are today. In fact, in the United States today, so as I'm recording this in the year 2020, our total fertility rate in the United States is below two. So that means on average, women are having right around 1.8 children. And that means we're kind of below this idea of replacement fertility. So replacement level fertility is the number of births required to offset the number of deaths. So it's what you need to do to keep the population stable. And globally, we put this number at 2.1 births per woman. And the reason why it's not exactly two is because there are a lot of diseases out there and random accidents that happen where if you have that exactly two children per woman, because you figure it takes two people to make one baby, so you have two children for that one woman. If you have those accidents, maybe not both of those are not going to make it. And I know that's terrible to say, um, but that's the reason why our number of births per woman is at 2.1. So if you look at our age structure diagram or population pyramid, you got to remember that the reproductive range of people, those are the ones that are having babies. So you want that part of the column to be pretty straight and you expect that the number of people post reproductive age is going to taper inward. Replacement level 
fertility is pretty different between developed and developing countries. So the developed countries have a total per fertility rate of about 2.0, and those developed countries are actually seeing their populations start to decline a little bit. The developing countries, on the other hand, they tend to have quite a bit higher total fertility rates. So if you look at this map on here, you can see that some of the developing countries have total fertility rates above seven births per woman. Now, when you have above seven births per woman, you're probably expecting that not all of those children are going to survive. And if you're going off the bat thinking not all of your children are going to make it, it kind of makes sense that you want to have a whole lot of kids. Now, in the developed countries, there tends to be higher levels of industrialization, there tends to be a higher income level, and people are more likely to have their children make it to adulthood. So typically they'll stop after two or only have a few children. Now I want to briefly mention the China one child policy. Now this is no longer in effect, however, China did see some pretty significant consequences as a result of this policy. So in 1979 is when the policy came into effect, and you can see on this graph that the total fertility rate in China was above six births per woman before this went into effect. Now there were several measures in place before the one-child policy that helped to bring that total fertility rate down. However, once they had that one child policy, they brought their total fertility rate down to two. Now you might be kind of wondering why is this at two if they were only allowed one birth per woman? Well, the reason is because in some of the rural parts of the country and some wealthier people were able to get some exceptions to that rule and they were still able to have more than one child. If you look at the population pyramid, you can see what this did to China's population as a whole. So you can see that after 1979, so the people that would be in their 30s in this graph or younger, we see this kind of inward decline on that pyramid. So we're starting to see it a bit inverse. So there's more, pop more people in the older generations than in the younger generations. So remember that line of people that are between 15 and 19 years old is not going to get bigger that cohort of people will only get smaller. So China is going to experience a pretty significant population decline as a result of this one child policy, which was what they were going for. However, I don't think they really thought it would be as effective as it ultimately was. Briefly, I want to loop this in to overall life expectancy. So life expectancy is how long on average you think that somebody is going to live. And again, life expectancy is really driven by what is the quality of life in that particular location. And you have to take into account infant mortality and child mortality. Now on the AP exam, you do need to know the difference between these two. Personally, I think it's a little nitpicky, but I just want to make sure that you know this is something they might pick out. So infant mortality means that the child died before they reached one year of age. Child mortality means they died before they reached the age of five. Now you're probably thinking that, well, if somebody's six years old, they're still a child. And yes, they are. But when we're looking at child mortality, a lot of the childhood diseases would probably kill a child before they reach the age of five if they are in a location that does not have access to high levels of medical care. So if we look at this map, you can see which countries around the world have high life expectancies. And if you think back to the other map, the locations that have high life expectancies also tend to have lower total fertility rates. So I think that's interesting that when you expect to live longer, you're probably not going to have quite as many children. So I think that's kind of interesting. This map is the inverse. This map is showing the infant mortality rate around the world. So countries that have a shorter life expectancy obviously would have higher infant mortality. I also want to talk a little bit about some of the factors that affect overall life expectancy and these other mortality rates. 
So it makes sense that if you have higher access to good health care and prenatal care, you're going to be able to live longer, healthier, happier life. Also makes sense if you're able to get enough food to nourish your body, you're able to actually avoid having to go into the medical system to require that help. But if you do have some kind of accident or come down with some illness, having that good health care will help you to live longer. Also, having access to potable drinking water, meaning the water that you are drinking is actually safe to drink. You would be amazed at how many people in this world do not have that access. And as a result, they are not able to live as long because their drinking water is probably contaminated. And that's also directly linked to having access to good sanitation and hygiene. A lot of places in the world, they do not have toilets that flush your waste away, clean and process that waste before releasing that treated liquids back into the environment. There are a lot of places with open sewers and ditches that are not too far away from their drinking water source. And when you have those two factors together, you're probably not going to be able to live as long. This also ties into places that have low levels of pollution are places where people are generally healthier. Because again, pollution in all of its form, as air pollution, as water pollution, as soil and terrestrial pollution, those are all things that negatively impact human lives. So in summary, you should be able to define and explain the factors that influence total fertility rate, life expectancy, infant mortality, and child mortality. Please send me your questions. I know I went kind of quickly through this. Um, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. And I hope that as you watch this video, you were able to learn something.